like more. <laughs> <laughs> no, I shall not. Yes. <laughs> of course, in the end, uh, Richard is deposed, and as Mr. Presley did say, uh, the line of the new uh, family of England, of course, uh, comes to power. Now you've seen a bit of a tragedy or history, as it were. Of course, what would Shakespeare be without, be without comedy as well? And uh, certainly music, something that you may not be as familiar with, but certainly music was part of Shakespeare in this time as well. I'll tell you a bit more about this, please. Welcome, uh, Mr. Ziarko, back to the stage. Thank you. Music is used throughout Shakespeare's works. He writes music into many of his pieces. And in fact, one that might be known even more than any others for that is The Tempest. The Tempest is a great one of his works, a little bit later on in his life. And it goes through, uh, throughout the play of music, these words of magic are all interwoven. But that play has a very specific tie-in here with Virginia itself. We've talked about all the ways that the 18th century has changed Shakespeare and affected Shakespeare. Well, let us go back a little bit further and talk about perhaps how Virginia itself affected Shakespeare's own writing back in the 17th century. For the play The Tempest is written about a year after an account is published in London. And this is an account of a man who is involved in a shipwreck. A shipwreck on three ships that were on their way to Jamestown. These ships wreck, and over the next year, the crews of those ships do their best to rebuild. And they rebuild two ships to deliver supplies here to the colony of Jamestown. And just as the people of Jamestown are about to give up, to they think all hope is lost, you see two ships coming down the river, the Deliverance and the Patience. These are two reconstruction ships from that shipwreck on a lonely island out there, and they saved the colony of Virginia. Well, this account is published, and it is not a full year after that that Shakespeare himself <coughs> writes an account of, or writes a play of a shipwreck on a magical island out in nowhere. So while we can't say directly that Shakespeare, for he never writes that he read this account, we do think that the timing is rather appropriate to see some influence of Virginia affecting Shakespeare himself in one of his greatest plays. But if we enjoy Shakespeare, we enjoy him here in our modern time, perhaps most for his comedies. And so to give you something to laugh at, something a bit lighter, please join me in welcoming Mr. Presley forward to set up some comedy. We love comedies here during this time. Uh, Mr. Ziarko and I are going to do a scene from one of Shakespeare's comedies, one of his most light-hearted pieces. And you love light-hearted pieces in the 18th century. Uh, we shall do a scene for you from The Two Gentlemen of Verona. And this is one of Shakespeare's first plays, written when he is but a mere teenager, my friends. He certainly has uh, the freshness of youth all over this play. Uh, you can certainly hear it even in the scene that we're about to do for you. Very lighthearted indeed, not, not the Macbeth and the Othellos, and uh, certainly uh, not the Tempest, as he uh, was talking about. Uh, but this uh, play of the two gentlemen of Verona is about, could you have guessed it, two gentlemen of Verona. Imagine that. Imagine now. Sir Proteus, you must give Sir Proteus an applause. <laughs> young Sir Proteus, very young and fresh-faced, as you can see. Uh, he is one of the two gentlemen of Verona. The other you will not see in the scene. Uh, for his best friend, the other gentleman of Verona, young Sir Valentine, has been shipped off to Milan on business at the beginning of the play. Um, this doesn't make young Sir Proteus all of that sad, though his best friend is shipped off, uh, because even though he and young Sir Valentine are best friends, they are also rivals as well. Uh, they often compete with each other, often over the affections of the same ladies. So what do you think about that? <laughs> Typical. So his young friend, Sir Valentine, is very well appropriately named as well. Uh, we're going to give you a, a scene right from the beginning of the play after Sir Valentine is shipped off. Uh, young Sir Proteus is all excited. He begins to send off love letters in the absence of his rival, <laughs> the influence of his competitor. Uh, and he begins by sending a love letter to young Julia. However, he does make uh, the small mistake of sending uh, this letter by uh, the servant of Sir Valentine, whose name is Speed, who I shall be in the sea, I think. He's going to <laughs> 
Speed is very appropriately named as well, although it's an odd sounding name, isn't it? Speed doesn't sound quite Shakespearean. Oh, but he is uh, very appropriately named because of the way he talks, you understand. Uh, <laughs> mouth going uh, very fast indeed. A bit of a smart aleck, as you would say in your modern time. Uh, he also schemes every once in a while. He's always trying to get a bit of money, uh, certainly, uh, being a, a servant that he is. Uh, and he comes upon the scene hearing the news that his master is shipped off, and he is also very sad as well. Not because he wished uh, to wish him a bon voyage, but because he wanted some coins from him before he left. <laughs> now, this allows Sir Proteus to question Speed about the letter that he uh, was supposed to have delivered. Uh, and, uh, Sir, uh, Speed is not very forthcoming with the information uh, because he will give up nothing for nothing. <laughs> you shall see a, a lighthearted scene with these two having a bit of fun with each other, uh, trying to outmatch each other uh, in wit. And as you see the scene delivered to you in the style of the 18th century, feel free to be an 18th century audience, giving up your opinions, good and bad, wherever you see fit. Ah, <laughs> oh, Sir Proteus save you. So you, my master. He departed hence to embark for Milan. Oh. Twenty-one, then, he's shipped already, and I have played the sheep in losing him. The sheep doth often strain if the shepherd be a while away. Oh, you conclude, then, that my master is a shepherd and I a sheep. I do. Oh, but then I want to his horns, whether I wake or sleep. <laughs> a silly answer, befitting well, a sheep. Uh, he still proves me a sheep. I and I, master the shepherd. Oh, nay, nay, that I can deny by a circumstance. It will go hard, but I'll prove it by another. Oh, the shepherd seeks the sheep, and not the sheep the shepherd, but I seek my master. My master does not seek me, therefore I am no sheep. <laughs> <laughs> the sheep for fodder follows the shepherd, the shepherd for food follows not the sheep. For wages thou followest thy master, thy master for wages follows not thee, therefore thou art a sheep. <laughs> oh, very good, very good. Oh, such another proof will make me cry. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> but come, gave us my letter to Julia. Oh, I, sir, I, a lost mutton, gave your letter to her, a laced mutton, and she, a laced mutton, gave me a lost mutton, nothing for my labor. <laughs> it's too small a pastor for such a store of muttons. Oh. Well, sir, if you think the ground be overcharged, twere best in the Jew sticker. Uh, oh. Nay, oh. in that you were astray, twere best pound you. Oh, nay, sir, nay. Less than a pound shall serve me for delivering your message. <laughs> <laughs> now, what said she? Uh, first, sir, a nodding. Aye. And that's not it. <laughs> sir, I say she did not. You asked if she did not, and I say I. I, and that set together is naughty. Oh, sir, <laughs> you have now taken the pains to set the two together. Perhaps you should take it now for your pain. Right, sir, <laughs> I have pains for bearing with you, sir. I swear I must be fain to bear with you. <laughs> sir, how do you bear with me? Mary, sir, the letter having been very orderly, having nothing but the word naughty for my pains. <laughs> Shrew me, but you have a quick wit. Uh, and yet it cannot overtake your slow purse, sir. <laughs> <laughs> um, come, open the matter and brief. Come, come, and open your purse, sir, so that the money and the matter may be both at once delivered. <laughs> now, what said she? Uh, truly, sir, I think you'll hardly win her. <laughs> you not receive uh -huh. much from her. I can perceive nothing at all from her, so no. Not so much as a ducat for delivering your letter. <laughs> and she being so hard to meet it brought your mind, I fear she'll prove as hard to you in telling your mind. Give her no token but stone, sir, for she's as hard as steel. But what said she? Nothing? Nothing, no. Not so much as take this for thy pains. <laughs> you can justify your bounty. I thank you. You have testified me. And you're quite aware of. Henceforth, carry your own letters yourself. But I'll commend you to my master. <laughs> 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 Bravo!